the two minutes. Okay. So just wanted everybody to know that. Three, three minutes, three minutes. Okay. Yeah. And Namata, did you want to introduce the session and the speakers, or how would you like to handle the uh, moderation? No, no, you carry on, uh, Tony. It's perfectly all right. I mean, we can just do the talks one after the other and then have a discussion. Whatever way, I mean, the way you planned is perfectly fine. So, okay, how about I'll introduce myself and the other speakers who precede me from the Coin Society, and then I'll turn it over to you for the rest. Okay, perfect. That's fine. Okay. I think I'll, I'll like to start sharing my screen. Um, let me just, okay, there we go. Dr. Titiel, how are you? Must be in a public area, have a mask so, on. So, so yeah, so we... Yeah, teacher. Sir, good, sir, you have good, to change Good morning, your good evening to all of you. Sorry, mm -hmm. I have a little delay. Sir, you have to yeah. change your background virtually. Okay, I'm sorry. And uh, uh, Tony, I think uh, one word from uh, Professor Titiel before we begin, and then from Dr. Himanshu Matalia. Uh, Professor Tetyal is uh, president of the ISKRAS and Himanshu is the president of the Corner Society. Okay, then we can begin the session. Is that fine? That sounds great. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Tetyal. Yeah, hi. Good evening. Good morning to all of you. I Good think now I have the same background. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I think you are in your office because you are masked. Yeah, it's a working time, no? What is... <laughs> Just give me five minutes. So we start? Be on standby. We are getting started in less than a minute. Okay, mm. okay, yeah. Uh, and then while the presenter is going, are the rest of us like off camera? I take it. Yes. Can we off camera? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. You can put your camera or put it off. I mean, it's it's perfectly okay, whichever way you want. Okay. Because that's they'll it. spotlight only on the presenter, so that's fine. Okay. Got it. Okay. We, we are live now, so I request uh, Dr. Anthony Aldev to please introduce and uh, take the proceedings further. I would uh, thank you very much for, uh, first of all, allowing the Cornea Society to participate in the International Ophthalmic Conclave 2022. It's a pleasure to join you virtually. Sorry, it can't be. Uh, in person. Uh, I think we have a few opening comments uh, from our commander in chief, Dr. Titial. So I'll turn it over to him. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Anthony. Uh, it is indeed a real pleasure from our side to see all of you today. And I know that uh, Dr. Namrata and uh, the All India Ophthalmological Society is doing a great job holding uh, this type of uh, international conclave where we get to see, get to listen to uh, experts from the world over. And it is really going to benefit uh, not only us, the entire society who are looking forward to listen to our uh, experts. And I'm pretty sure the timings we have, the speakers and the panelists, we're going to have a great discussion for the benefit of uh, people who have joined us today. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, this session is happening in a time where I think people will be awake, both in India and abroad. And most welcome, all of you. And thank you, Namata, for uh, getting this entire you know act of uh, cornea together. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tony. Okay, yeah. I would uh, I would uh, invite now Dr. Himanshu Matalia, President of the Cornea Society of India, to say a few words before we start our scientific program. Thank you, Dr. Namrata, and uh, greetings from Kanya Society of India. It's heartwarming to see the luminaries of uh, Kanya uh, on one dais and uh, such a wonderful conclave. I really like to congratulate 
congratulate uh, Dr. Namrata for bringing such beautiful concept of bringing all the societies together and which should certainly benefit one and all. I'm really looking forward uh, for this session and uh, we'll have really good time. Thank you very much, Dr. Namrata. Thank you. I think Tony, you can take over now. Okay, thank you. So the the uh, theme of this uh, symposium is the present and the future of our field. And I think uh, after the last two years of the pandemic, being separated from our colleagues, uh, connecting only uh, virtually, we're all very much looking forward to the future. And I would like to invite our uh, first speaker, Dr. Prasal Janshi, uh, to share sort of his vision, his vision for the future and an aspect of his practice, uh, which is the management of ocular graft versus host disease. Dr. Janchi is a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He is known to corneal specialists worldwide, and it's an honor to have him as part of the program. Vishal, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Can everyone see my screen and hear me well? Perfect, perfect. All right. Okay. Well, well, you know, everyone has thanked everybody else. So we'll just move on with the presentation. Um, uh, my topic is ocular graft versus host disease. And um, I have to say five years ago, this was uh, something newish to me, if not new. But if, if you are like me, if you work in a hospital, which is next to a cancer center, well, I can tell you over the next five years or so, you're going to see a host of these patients and you got to know what to do with these patients. They can be really challenging to manage. I do not have any financial disclosures that are relevant to this talk. So I'll be looking at uh, presenting an overview of GVHD, current treatment options for GVHD, uh, some new treatments on the horizon. This is an exciting part. And, you know, try and see if you can prevent ocular GVHD. It's going to be challenging though. So... I'm just going to reduce this. Okay. Um, what happens in, in, in allergenic uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, HSCD, basically uh, after total body irradiation and chemotherapies and anti antibody treatment to kill the cancer cells. Um, traditionally, we used to get the donor uh, heme stem cells from the bone marrow. Nowadays, they can be used from the umbilical cord as well. Uh, once, you, once you do that, the, it sort of activates the donor the, uh, the T cells, which causes the graft versus host disease, which further causes a multitude of problems throughout the body. And over the past 15 years or so, people have been trying to publish more and more to highlight the ocular problems that are associated with graft versus host disease. So uh, GVHD is of two types, acute and chronic. Uh, as I mentioned, it is a T-cell mediated disease. Acute GVHD is seen in the first 100 days of the of transplantation. Multiple studies have shown that if uh, uh, ocular involvement happens in acute GVHD, it's actually a prognostic, poor prognostic factor for uh, which is associated with higher mortality. mortality. Um, common ocular symptoms include excessive tearing, redness, eye pain, conjunctival involvement is the highlight of acute GVHD, acute ocular GVHD causing hyperemia. Chemosis is massive sometimes. You see pseudomembranes, symblephron, almost like a, uh, a sort of like a psychiatrical disease presentation, but in acute form. Um, I have seen some patients with corneal ulceration in acute GVHD. They're really, really difficult to manage. Uh, saving the eye is very difficult in these patients. Chronic GVHD is, is what we see more commonly, fortunately, uh, in the clinic. The pathophysiology of chronic GVHD is less understood. Ocular involvement is high. Uh, 40 to 60% of these patients will have ocular involvement of some sort at, at some point in their, in their disease. Common ocular symptoms are just dryness. Um, and everything sort of ensues after that. Uh, three important processes, which are really important if you see these patients. Lacrimal gland dysfunction. So the, basically these glands are being destroyed in these patients, uh, even mebobian gland dysfunction, which is actually as bad as lacrimal gland dysfunction. So you have a multitude of, of uh, phenomena happening, which lead to a poor ocular surface. Corneoconjunctival inflammation is also another highlight of the disease. And I'll show you some pictures, what I mean um, uh, by saying corneoconjunctival inflammation. You will see how the dry eye in GVHD is, is quite distinct, quite different from the usual dry eye that we see. Less commonly in chronic GVHD, um, we see patients with scleritis, uveitis, vitritis, hemorrhages on the retina and cotton spots, and also 
coronal detachment. So it is very important that you uh, look at the disc and macula in these patients in every single follow-up. So all our patients are dilated um, if they can sit up right uh, when they're in the clinic. So some of the pictures, so uh, these have been collected over the past few years in my clinic. Um, I, I use uh, staining in the rattan filter, which has been really, really helpful. Uh, what I have noticed is that the corneal staining can sometimes be very patchy. Uh, one quadrant would be involved focally in these patients and the rest of the cornea might not look too bad. Uh, we do see a lot of filaments. Filaments are seen more commonly in acute ocular GVHD, but in chronic ocular GVHD or on acute on chronic GVHD, you can see some, some filaments. And as I mentioned, meibomian gland dysfunction is, is the highlight of the disease, causing a lot of photophobia in these patients. Another patient showing sort of a, a corneal involvement just in one quadrant, and you can see those clumped filaments. This is a patient with chronic GVHD with patchy corneal straining. Another patient, uh, you can see uh, how the cornea, the, sort of this epithelial cell clumping, which is which causes a lot of foreign body sensation, um, uh, grittiness, and also photophobia in these patients. Corneal conjunctival involvement, you can see the 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 amount of staining is it's just unprecedented. It's just it's just too much on the cornea. Also, the conjunctival involvement is is quite it's quite uh, significant in these patients on in these two pictures. Another patient uh, with the staining of the conjunctiva and the cornea and one filament. I showed these pictures uh, earlier also. Um, this is a patient with, with chronic, almost burnt out disease, uh, ocular GVHD. A patient has been stable on ceramide drops uh, with, with massive corneal scar, with tarsal scarring. So um, it, the glands are obliterated and the subtarsal fibrosis sort of takes over in these patients. So the, the dryness is, is almost permanent. Uh, this is an unfortunate patient. He was uh, had GVHD with keratoconus. He was using lenses, um, contact lenses. So he came back with, with a massive infection. Uh, we cultured him. Uh, the thinning was quite significant. He grew scedosporium, fungus, and pseudomonas together. Um, we almost lost the eye, uh, but I think the patient was more hopeful than we were, which actually helped. Did a tarsorophy, a long-term treatment. He ended up with a corneal scar. And I just uh, operated on him uh, a couple of weeks uh, ago, and this is sort of day one post-op. Uh, so, so these complications are, are commonly seen in these patients. This is another young patient with acute on chronic GVHD. Look at how the epithelium, uh, sort of epithelial defect is, is so chronic, almost calcareous degeneration, which is also a hallmark of chronic GVHD and corneal involvement and corneal involvement. Um, the patient was on systemic treatment, systemic steroids. This is the first presentation. Um, uh, I started the patient on ceramide drops, but the patient never came back for follow-up. Unfortunately, we lost the patient. He passed away within a month of his follow-up. So treatment-wise, it is important to reduce ocular surface inflammation to prevent any psychiatric changes. Very, very important to speak to your to oncology, hematology team. Uh, uh, you got to let them know what you are seeing in, on the eye so that they might be able to titrate the treatment. I stay in touch with, with my hemonc team all the time for, for these patients. Um, prevention of tear evaporation, usual stuff, more aggressive though, more warm compressors, lid scrubs, lid hygienes. Topical erythromycin ointment does help and when the MGD is really bad. I, I try and not use too many tetracyclines in these patients just because they're on, on so many drugs already. Moisture chamber goggles do help. My patients are very happy using moisture chamber goggles. Uh, preservative free artificial tear drops and ointments. Acetylcysteine, difficult to get in the United States, easier to get in the US, uh, in, in India. Uh, good for filamentary keratitis. Um, some patients, very few, uh, we do start on five milligram uh, twice a day or thrice a day pilocarpine. Of course, the hemong team and PCP are involved. Ceramide drops, mainstay of treatment. Um, all my patients, they get 20% ceramide drops. Rarely, I go up to 50%. Uh, some of them, um, if they are in chronic phase, lenses, scleral lenses will help. Uh, punctal occlusion, um, uh, you, will, you will find... Um, different opinions on, on if the punctal inclusion should be done for these patients with dry eyes. Um, and if you are uh, a part of the GVHD uh, core group, which is I think run still by UIC every two years, you will, you will understand that punctal occlusion is, is not indicated in these patients. I do not occlude the puncta 
Uh, we want the inflammatory stuff uh, from the eye surface to wash out or wash away and not stay on the eye. Once, to, once you occlude the puncta, it becomes difficult to control the inflammation in these patients. Topical steroids, short term, they're helpful for conjunctival involvement. I use a lot of restasis, you can use something else, so cyclosporin, 0.05% or 0.1% if you can get it compounded. Uh, I do have access to topical tacrolimus ointment, not eye drops, but they are supposed to help as well. Surgical intervention is rarely needed, which is again fortunate. Uh, I, we use a lot of amniotic membrane uh, membranes in the office for patients who have poor uh, epithelia, corneal epithelium. Uh, tarsography, as I showed in that patient uh, who needed a corneal transplant, is needed sometimes for a persistent epithelial defects. And if you see a patient with acute GVHD, you might need to do an emergency transplant in these patients. New treatments, um, diocofazole and ribepamide, which are commonly used in Japan, also in India. They're supposed to increase the mucin production and they also have anti-inflammatory effects. Um, I did have some uh, uh, experience with these two when I was working in Hong Kong, but not anymore because they're still not available in the United States. Uh, topical immunoglobulin eye drops, fantastic work uh, from UIC again, Sandeep Jain's group. Uh, he has shown that there's significant reduction in signs and symptoms uh, in phase one, phase two clinical trials. We were a part of a clinical trial where we use a, top, a topical fibrinogen depleted human platelet lysate. Uh, this is, uh, I think we've submitted this for publication. It was a phase one, phase two clinical trial and uh, the results were quite encouraging. So that's that's something that's we are looking forward to. Topical heparin eye drops, at least three or four good papers uh, heparin at, at a low dose of uh, 100 international units per mil. Uh, it clears what we call uh, the nets, the neutrophil extracellular traps, which are supposed to worsen the ocular GVHD. Uh, heparin also has antifibrotic and immunosuppressive effects that helps in these patients. Um, at least one paper on entosplenitib, which is actually a spleen-related tyrosine kinase inhibitor, um, in mice eyes, clinical trials are underway. Um, actually, the effect on eyes um, with entosplenative was, was sort of a, a secondary outcome of, the, of this study, but it's supposed to help um, at least mice. So we'll see what happens when it comes uh, to human beings. Prevention, early detection is the best bet for now. Um, if you are working in a big hospital, as I mentioned, stay in touch with your hemong team. Let them know about ocular GVHD if they don't know that already. And we try and get these patients on a regular basis. Um, as I said, as, as one of the studies shows, get them within six months after their HSCT and do regular exam, at least have a baseline exam. One study from Mexico showed that um, uh, topical cyclosporin um, started uh, after HSCT for one year, actually had better outcomes in terms of uh, uh, development of ocular GVHD. So, you know, restasis might actually help in these patients. I don't have experience using restasis without any symptoms in these patients, but this is really interesting. So in, to summarize, ocular GVHD is common after HSCD and it causes significant ocular morbidity. It can in, affect the entire ocular surface. Early detection and treatment is, is really important to control the inflammation and more is better than less in these patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for a really interesting uh, presentation and a nice glimpse of maybe the future of treating one of the most challenging conditions to treat, certainly that I think many of us see in our practices. Uh, our next speaker is Jennifer Lee. Uh, she is professor at Department of Ophthalmology, UC Davis. Uh, she is director of the Cornea and External Disease Service at UC Davis. And uh, her topic uh, today is lessons learned from COVID-19 and the long-term impact on eye banking. Jennifer. Great, thanks so much. Hopefully you guys can hear me and see my slides. Um, but thank you, Dr. Aldave and Dr. Sharma for the invitation just to participate um, in the symposium today. Um, I thought, you know, in light of the past two years that we have, <laughs> that we talk just a little bit more about COVID-19, um, but hopefully get to some of the longer-term impacts um, that COVID-19 will have for us as corneal surgeons. Um, I have no financial interest to disclose. So over the next 10 minutes or so, I thought we'd look at um, some of the lessons that we've learned during the pandemic, uh, how the pandemic has progressed, the ocular manifestations of disease, 
how it impacts corneal tissue. But then I really want us to focus on the lasting impact of the pandemic on eye banking, corneal transplantation, and hopefully uh, touch on just a little bit the global burden of corneal blindness. The course of the COVID-19 pandemic is obviously something that we're very familiar with at this point. Um, at last count in the US, we've had 78 million reported cases and nearly 1 million deaths. Around the world, 419 million reported cases, uh, again, probably a significant underestimation, and nearly 6 million deaths. And despite decreasing numbers here in the US, around the world, there are still certain hotspots with Omicron in many places. And we really may never know the true impact of COVID-19 um, around the world for lack of widespread testing in certain areas of the world. And I know we are all very tired of talking and thinking about COVID. So I'll try and make this interesting. But before I get to what I think is the more interesting part, we're just gonna do a quick review. Um, by now, we should all be aware that the primary, one of the primary impacts of COVID-19 on the eyes can actually cause a conjunctivitis. In some reports, there's as many as 30% of patients may develop some ocular manifestation of COVID-19. And with COVID, as with many viral conjunct conjunctivitises, uh, patients most commonly have a bi bilateral follicular conjunctivitis. Um, conjunctivitis can be either an early presenting sign of COVID-19 or may develop later with more severe disease. Um, there have also been scattered case reports of more severe ocular service involvement, including a case of unilateral keratoconjunctivitis and a case of hemorrhagic pseudomembranous conjunctivitis. Posterior involvement um, has also been reported, although it appears less common. Uh, the most common posterior involvement involves microvascular disease with retinal hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, dilated vessels, and there are some reports of CRVOs, panuveitis, and even optic neuritis. So in light of what we know about how COVID-19 affects the eyes, what implication does this ultimately have on donor corneal tissue? Again, at this point, we know that SARS-CoV spreads from exposure of infected respiratory droplets and aerosol particles to exposed surfaces, including the ocular surface. Um, multiple studies have demonstrated the expression of ACE2 um, on the conjunctiva and cornea of the ocular surface. Um, and ultimately, SARS-CoV-2 <laughs> depends on entry of um, the viral spike protein binding to the host ACE2 receptors. And so ACE2 is found on the ocular surface. But when looking to see if SARS-CoV-2 can actually replicate on the human corneal tissue, um, we've actually been unable to detect true replication of SARS-CoV-2 on donor corneal tissue. And so this suggests that perhaps um, human cornea and conjunctiva may not really support infection of SARS-CoV-2, despite the presence of these receptors. But obviously, for those of us who are performing corneal transplantation, we still need to know if donor-to-recipient transmission is possible. And unfortunately, you know, SARS-CoV-2 mRNA has been detected on conjunctival swabs and even post-mortem vitreous samples um, in the eye. Uh, but to date, as far as I'm aware, there's still only one reported case where infectious virus was cultured from the ocular swab. Um, when we tested donor corneas uh, for transplantation, um, studies have shown that there can be a relatively high rate of positivity, um, even in asymptomatic donors. Um, in one study where they started doing routine post-mortem testing on all donors, they found nearly a 5% positivity rate on donors who otherwise would have met all other criteria for uh, transplantation. Okay, so in light of how far we've come and how little we knew two years ago about COVID-19, I have to say I'm actually very, very impressed and proud to be part of the response that iBanks across the world have had in response to this pandemic. We have put safety first, and that's not just safety of the donor tissue and our recipients, but it's safety for our recovery techs and our processing eye bank technicians. It's safety for us as surgeons and safety ultimately for our communities. Um, we have really stepped on trying to make recommendations from a very early, early, early time in the US. Um, we've been on, on the ball 
starting in January. Uh, we've come up with guidances regularly based on new information, based on CDC recommendations, based on advice from infectious disease experts, and based on feedback from surgeons and eye bankers. I do not want to spend a whole lot of time on our current recommendations, but these can be found on the EBA website. Um, the most recent recommendations have decreased the duration of time, uh, shortened the duration of time uh, of donor ineligibility after a positive COVID test. Finally, what I want us to focus a little bit on today is the impact of COVID-19 on eye banking and corneal transplantation globally. Um, in the US, at least in 2020, you can see how the shutdown caused cessation of elective cases. And there was a nearly 80% decline um, in corneal transplantation, corneal tissues being recovered. By the end of 2020, we were actually able to recover up to about 85% of normal volume. Uh, the 2021 numbers are not yet available. Around the globe, um, we saw similar impacts. In India, there was again, close to 80% reduction in corneas recovered for transplantation during the peak of the shutdown. In Italy, about 58 to 60% reduction. Um, Germany seemed to do a little bit better than the rest of us with only a 17% reduction. Um, but obviously the impact is not just on uh, the donor, donor tissue, it's on corneal transplantation ultimately. And with corneal transplantation grinding to a halt um, during the lockdown, you can see here, uh, the numbers is dropping precipitously in March and April of 2020. In the US, surgeons have had the luxury of resuming near normal surgical volume. Um, but the same really can't be said for our colleagues who depend on tissue from US eye banks around the world. We see the impact on corneal transplantation in other countries as well. In Mexico, um, there was an 88% reduction in public institutions and a 64% reduction in corneal transplantation at private institutions. And you can see how setting um, can impact, again, healthcare disparity. In Brazil, they saw an 82% reduction in corneal transplantation during um, the elective surgery moratorium. But even after resuming elective cases, there continued to be a 30% decline in cases. Which brings us to sort of the final point, which is that the long-term impact on patients globally waiting for corneal transplantation is going to be quite profound. Um, in Brazil, they estimate that in order to reach pre-pandemic waiting list volumes, they would need an 81% increase in monthly transplantation over the course of two years. And so with the problem that we've had with corneal transplantation uh, worldwide, even prior to pan the pandemic, um, we're gonna have bigger problems long-term going forward. Um, and so my final thoughts are really just that eye banking and transplantation, we're not immune to the problems that the rest of the world is having with things like global supply chain issues. Um, we've had delays in supplies, we've had delays in shipping, and these impacts again are not gonna recover overnight. Um, we continue to not really know the final impact of COVID on donor, donor corneal transplantation. I suspect that the risk to our recipients is actually going to be quite low. And so hopefully over time, we'll be able to open up the donor pool further and further to help the problems that we have um, with access to tissue. And then finally, um, we'll continue to, to balance the safety of the donor pool with the needs of recipients and surgeons. But again, the long-term impacts are going to be coming for many, many years. And as a group, I think we need to start really focusing on healthcare disparities around the globe for all of our patients. So, thanks so much. Sorry for the dog. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful presentation. And is this the culprit on the slide? <laughs> uh, yes, it is. And uh, it's getting past okay, her bedtime. Now, Scout, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, the reason I remember that, of course, is our dog, one of our dogs name is Scout as well. So by right, the first panel, we have two people whose dog is two dogs named Scout. Uh, so and I'm sure if I were at home, our Scout would be trying to uh, in, interject in my presentation as well. So thank you. It was a great, great talk. Um, our next speaker, Lisa Nijum, is founder and medical director at the Warrenville Eye Care and LASIK Center. She's an assistant clinical professor of ophthalmology. She wears many hats, many of you know her from Women in Ophthalmology. Uh, her topic tonight, again, keeping in this theme of 
looking forward to the future is neurotrophic keratitis, painless challenges and future treatments. Lisa. Thank you so much, Tony, and thank you, Namrata and the uh, International Conclave and the Cornea Society for this wonderful invitation. So I am uh, delighted to speak to you about neurotrophic keratitis and where we're uh, at and looking for in the future here. Let me just advance the slide. Great, these are my financial disclosures. Uh, so in this uh, brief discussion today, I wanna uh, review some of the prevalence and stages of neurotrophic keratitis, uh, discuss the pathophysiology burden of disease and etiology of NK, the, what we know now and more things that we know now, and then uh, give a brief overview of the current and upcoming treatments for NK. So the prevalence of neurotrophic keratitis is really, it's very interesting because it's incredibly difficult to determine. Uh, initially estimated to be less than 1.6 out of 10,000, uh, but when we look at data from the most common conditions associated with neurotrophic keratitis, uh, you see higher numbers. So in herpes simplex, about 6% develop NK, in zoster, about 12.8%, and post-surgical nerve damage results in uh, about 2.8% develop. So uh, uh, when they looked retrospectively, an epidemiologic study suggests a higher prevalence of 11 out of 10,000. Uh, but the truth is that I really think that NK is often uh, diagnosed delayed, the diagnosis is delayed or missed entirely. Um, and we know this from the patients that we see coming into our office uh, and uh, unfortunately how severe those cases are sometimes. So I thought we would go back to the basics a little bit and review what we know about the pathophysiology of neurotrophic keratitis to understand what treatments we have now and what treatments are coming in the pipeline. Uh, and so you're gonna have to answer this on your own, scout's honor, uh, more scout in the presentations. Uh, the cornea is the most innervated tissue in the human body. Uh, how many nociceptors per millimeter squared are there on the corneal epithelium? Is it 70, 700? 7,000 or 70,000. And if we were live or you're in person, I'd play some Jeopardy music for you, but you're just gonna have to hum that in your head now. So uh, the answer is actually 7,000 nociceptors per millimeter squared. Uh, and the cornea is indeed the most densely innervated tissue in the human body. Um, the nerve bundles, um, as you probably all know, just a little review here, um, enter the cornea at the limbus, move towards the center below the anterior third of the stroma, penetrate Bowman's layer, and create this dense network of nerve fibers between Bowman's layer and um, basal epithelial cells. And that forms what we know as the subbasal uh, nerve plexus uh, and has the characteristics um, pattern of nerves that we see running 12 to 6, um, 11 to 5, et cetera. Um, so keeping that in mind, what can cause neurotrophic keratitis? And it really is an abnormal sensory innervation anywhere along the neural pathway. So it can be a trigeminal lesion um, from trigeminal neuralgia surgery and aneurysm and meningioma, uh, ciliary lesions, uh, tumors or orbital surgery, lesions on the cornea, that's where herpetic disease comes in, or chemical injuries, uh, chronic contact lens wear, chronic use of uh, topical medications, um, or things like a brainstem lesion or an ocular nerve lesion. Um, Panretinal photocoagulation has also been associated with neurotrophic keratitis, as has cyclocoagulation. Uh, so really any interruption along those pathways. Uh, so what happens now on a, a basic science pathophysiology level when you discuss disrupting corneal trigeminal innervation, two things uh, occur. One is it impairs trophic factors. So trophic factors, you want to remember, those are things like neuropeptides, like substance P, and it decreases the neuropeptides that are there. So that's going to result in corneal epithelial changes and impaired corneal healing. Simultaneously, you're gonna, you can impair the trigeminal reflexes. So that's gonna impair the lacrimal glands release of growth factors and nutrients as well, contributing to decreased tear production and blink rate, which is further going to impair corneal healing. So those things together, the corneal epithelial changes, impaired corneal healing and the decreased tear production and blink rate result in spontaneous corneal epithelial breakdown, 
which is going to cause a neurotrophic keratitis that we're all aware of. And this becomes important when we start looking at the available treatment options and what is in research in the pipeline and to where it fits along in this pathophysiology. I think it's, uh, it's telling to look at the nerves uh, on the cornea um, with uh, neurotrophic keratitis. Um, and this is indeed from uh, one of the seminal papers on that showing the normal nerve distribution, then how the decrease in mild NK to moderate NK to severe NK, where you can barely see the nerves on the surface. A brief review of the MACI classifications, uh, stage one, rose bengal staining of the inferior palpebral conjunctiva, decreased tear breakup time, increased mucus viscosity, and punctate corneal epithelial um, staining that can be mistaken for dry eye. And then we proceed to stage two, where you have epithelial defect that's usually that oval um, surrounded by a rim loose epithelium and edges can become smooth and rolled. Um, and you can start getting some anti-inflammatory reaction. And then finally, stage three, a corneal ulceration, uh, stromalysis and melting and perforation. So uh, the best opportunity to reverse ocular surface damage by neurotrophic keratitis is with early diagnosis. And I participate on expert consensus on the identification, diagnosis, and treatment of neurotrophic keratitis led by Reza Dana, um, last year published in um, BMC Ophthalmology. Uh, and in reviewing it was set up as a Delphi panel. So we reviewed um, over 700 uh, projected cases of patient characteristics for neurotrophic keratitis. And the one thing that came up over and over again is the corneal sensitivity testing. And so that's really something that um, as cornea specialists, I know that we all do, uh, but it's something that we need to continuously emphasize in our teachings um, to the general community to help decrease uh, or help decrease the number of cases and help uh, earlier identification. Uh, so the treatment of neurotrophic keratitis, uh, typically with preservative free artificial tears, um, topical antibiotics, if there's any defect or large contact lenses, amniotic membrane has been shown uh, to help uh, improve healing as well as tarsorophy. Corneal neuroticization has become a more popular uh, technique uh, in the US, um, involves multiple specialties um, to try and re the cornea. And then um, most recently over the past few years, uh, with the recognition of nerve growth factor, again, going back to the pathophysiology, understanding epithelial proliferation, differentiation, and um, how that uh, is critical to the survival of corneal sensory nerves, um, the recombinant uh, human, human nerve growth factor, Snedrin, um, was uh, evaluated and approved in Europe and the US, and that's now a routine part of my practice um, for neurotrophic keratitis patients. And then looking at future directions, uh, research studies have now focused on developing novel treatments for neurotrophic keratitis and looking at several polypeptides, including those growth factors in the neuromediators um, that have been proposed. So if you recall, that was um, so one of the initial impaired trophic factors uh, looking to uh, provide those trophic factors early on um, to decrease the progression of neurotrophic keratitis and hopefully involve an early resolution. And so studies are currently being conducted across uh, several entities on topical treatments with substance P and IGF insulin-like growth factor one um, that have been demonstrating an effect on epithelial healing. So it'll be very interesting to see where that moves um, here in the future. So uh, just a uh, Kind reminder to, if you don't think about NK, you will miss NK. We know the most common causes uh, are herpes simplex, zoster, um, intracranial space occupying lesion, diabetes, and neurosurgical procedures. The best opportunity to reverse ocular surface damage is to identify it early, um, which is a great reminder for corneal sensation. Um, and then knowing some of these options to treat NK, uh, modifying our treatments to include the neuro, the newer options, and perhaps incorporating those sooner into practice, as well as realizing that the pathophysiology is being uh, well studied now or better studied now, and we have new things coming along the way that may even uh, help earlier in the process. So thank you very much. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Certainly, it's amazing how much uh, interest there is in NK currently, uh, as compared to maybe even just five years ago. 
uh, partly obviously due to the availability of Snedrimin and a number of other compounds that are under clinical investigation currently. Uh, so now it's my turn. Uh, I, would, I would introduce Dr. Tony Aldave, who actually needs no introduction. He is going to be, uh, uh, he's uh, uh, vice president of the International Relations Konya Society International. He's uh, uh, currently working in the University of California at Los Angeles School of Medicine, Department of Ophthalmology, Jules Stein Eye Institute, uh, LA, California. And more importantly, he visits India almost at least once in a year and sometimes twice or three times a year. And we're really missing him uh, physically here. So hope to have you this year itself physically and over to Tony for his presentation on the present and the future of keratoprosthesis surgery. We do have Dr. Kunjal Sejpal also, who's been your fellow Tony in the panel. I saw, I saw Kunjal, it was good to see her. And uh, hopefully we can interact a bit during the chat. And Namrata, again, I, I thank you and uh, for the invitation to have the Cornish Society be part of this uh, conclave. And my topic uh, today is the present and future of keratoprosthesis surgery. Um, I have no financial interests relevant uh, to this uh, presentation, uh, but other than the fact I am a consultant um, for Gore, who is developing a keratoprosthesis. So you are, many of you are familiar with the disadvantages of the Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis, and this is true for the RO keratoprosthesis, of course, which has a virtually identical design. Uh, the cost, um, of course, it's more affordable for you in India than us here in the US is 5,000 US dollars per keratoprosthesis. Uh, the unnatural appearance uh, is an issue. Uh, the fact that a donor cornea is required uh, that can undergo necrosis or become infected and the development or progression of glaucoma. So we'll talk about some advances that have been made uh, to the Boston keratoprosthesis and then some newer keratoprosthesis designs that are aimed at uh, addressing these complications. So the first uh, here we'll talk about is this uh, cost and the unnatural appearance as you see depicted here. A newer version of the Boston keratoprosthesis is the Lucia. Uh, you'll note uh, from the image, let me pull up a laser pointer, uh, that this is a very different looking backplate. Uh, here in this case, we have a petaloid uh, appearance of the backplate uh, that is titanium, very different from the backplate that's commercially available. And here's a patient uh, with this uh, Lucia in situ. It does still require a donor cornea. Uh, it is still a two-piece design, so similar to the click-on version of the Boston keratoprosthesis. Uh, the front plate is PMMA, which the current Boston keratoprosthesis is as well. But you'll notice what's different is Lucia only comes in one power for aphakia. So rather than having uh, a number of aphakic models from 19 millimeters to 31 or 30 millimeters of uh, actual length, in this case, the device is only available in one, which significantly reduces the production cost. And uh, the manufacturer found that 23.5 was the average axial length being requested. So that's what this comes in. Obviously, if the patient has a longer or a shorter eye, a soft contact lens can be worn to correct the resultant refractive error. Uh, it still also comes in a, a pseudophagic uh, power as well. There's also only one diameter of backplate. No longer do we have a seven millimeter backplate and an eight and a half millimeter backplate. Now we have one that's 7.75, again, reducing production costs. The material is titanium, but you note it doesn't have that unnatural metallic silver appearance. In this case, it's sort of a light brown that also can come in a blue model. Uh, and this is achieved through a process called anatization. In the petaloid, uh, design of these openings in the back plate means that the total area for aqueous to gain access to the stroma is larger, so it may reduce the risk of stromal uh, melting, and also gives a more overall natural appearance uh, because of the petaloid appearance being more similar to that of, we, of the iris than the round holes in the current version of the back plate. All right, so another complication uh, that is being uh, looked at is sterile donor corneal stromal necrosis. And why do we see this with a Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis? Well, we see it because we need a donor to carry the keratoprosthesis. So if you have a donor cornea, 
then you could be at risk for developing infection, melting, et cetera, as we see in this picture. Rigid design. The cornea, of course, is flexible, has a modulus e elasticity. The keratoprosthesis, the Boston, is rigid. And so it just makes sense that over time, that that junction between the rigid and the flexible tissue is going to result in some breakdown of the flexible tissue. And also, of course, the lack of biointegration. And this is, I think, really the holy grail of keratoprosthesis development is making a keratoprosthesis that is truly biointegrating. So Gore, uh, the company that makes Gore-Tex, you may be familiar with, uh, is a lot of ski jackets and uh, make also another other medical materials and devices, has developed a keratoprosthesis that's currently in animal studies. It is fully synthetic. There is no donor cornea required. It's one piece, as you see depicted here, has a flexible optic and skirt. The optic is made out of a floral elastomer and the skirt is coated with this expanded PTFE, which is the proprietary uh, material that is uh, in Gore-Tex. It is suturable. Uh, so this makes it easier to implant and uh, gives it uh, more uh, integrity as far as after it's been implanted in the cornea and allows for bioadherence, not necessarily biointegration, but bioadherence. What do I mean by that? Well, as you can see this device in cross-section, it's an intrastromal implantation. You see with a skirt here, uh, midsection in the corneal stroma and the uh, wall of the anterior portion of the optic and the entirety of the skirt is coated with this PTFE, which allows for bioadherence to the surrounding corneal stroma. The optic itself, as you saw in the previous image, is flexible. So reducing some of that risk potentially that's associated with a rigid optic. And the surface of the keratoprosthesis is flush with the corneal surface. So let's take a look at a video uh, of the implantation. This is in a, uh, a rabbit. In this case, the optic is six millimeters. So a 5.5 millimeter uh, trephination is performed. Uh, then this blade is used to make a mid lamellar pocket. Uh, and then as tree fine is used to open up the uh, remaining posterior stroma. The posterior stroma is then removed and then the device is implanted, as you can see here. So in this case, the surgical technique is quite straightforward. Uh, obviously, it's easier in a cornea like this that is not scarred or vascularized in a, uh, a real patient. Uh, of course, this, the visualization may not be quite as good. Uh, in some cases, maybe you could use a femtosecond laser to create uh, these incisions, but in many cases, it has to be done manually, as you see here. And then it's sutured in place. You, you note that the sutures are being passed from the uh, recipient into the, in this case, the donor, which is the keratoprosthesis, a little bit unusual. Uh, but the technique for implantation is certainly something that would not be too hard to uh, become facile with. So that device, as I mentioned, is in animal uh, studies. Um, I'm not sure how much I can disclose, but I believe we'll be seeing first in human implantations, hopefully in about a year from now. Uh, another novel keratoprosthesis is the uh, Cornete. This has uh, been designed by a brilliant investigator from Israel. This is also uh, a device that is uh, fully synthetic and does not require a donor cornea. It is a dual member optic and skirt design. The optic, again, is PMMA, like the Boston keratoprosthesis. The skirt, though, is electrospun polyurethane fibers, which allows biointegration. Uh, it's a flexible skirt, suturable, and as I mentioned, the big advantage here is the skirt allows biointegration. It's easiest to understand uh, this device by looking at both this animated video as well as a surgical uh, video here on the right. This is Dr. Irit Bahar implanting the first device in Israel a little over a year ago. So in this surgery, the first step is to perform a 360 degree limbal pritomy, as you saw uh, just a moment ago. The epithelium is then removed. The center of the cornea is then carefully marked. This device is then used to indicate location of pairs of sutures that'll be placed, as well as the location for paracentesis incisions that will be used to gain access to the anterior chamber. Uh, an incision is then made along one of these paracentesis incisions. And then we'll note that uh, the device is then prepared. A double arm non-absorbable suture is then uh, passed through, as you see these adjacent marks at the limbus, 
and then through the keratoprosthesis skirt. Uh, once this is performed and a trephination uh, is performed, the uh, cornea is then removed. If uh, intraocular surgery like cataract extraction, et cetera, needs to be done, this is when it would be per, uh, performed. And then the double-armed uh, sutures are then pulled such that the device is brought into uh, its position. Now, we need to get the remaining cornea uh, to fit inside this groove on the edge of the optic, and that's performed with this device called the snapper, uh, as you see. And this is, I've, I've done this in the wet lab. This is, can be a little bit challenging, uh, but I think certainly with some practice can become pretty doable. Uh, then the conjunctiva is closed over the skirt, as you see here, and it's closed both the sutures, and I think they recommend using 5 and tissue sealant. So it's the skirt that biointegrates into the conjunctiva, a bit of a, a novel uh, design. Does it truly biointegrate? Uh, well, here we can see this article published in Cornea a few months ago, looking at the uh, device, and I'll zoom in here on the upper right. You can notice here that the arrow, uh, arrows point to fibroblasts that are inside the, uh, the skirt. Now, also in this image here in panel C, the arrows indicate capillaries that have infiltrated the skirt. And here in the panel D, the arrows indicate uh, collagen present in that skirt. So uh, based on uh, this study, we do actually see biointegration of uh, this device. Um, there have been, I think, about five or six cases implanted worldwide thus far. Uh, we're hoping to have FDA approval later this year and Ed Holland in Cincinnati and I will be the two US investigators for this device. The last uh, topic I wanna to just briefly touch on is our inability to measure intraocular pressure in patients with a Boston type one keratoprosthesis. And this is, uh, I think been addressed now by the development of this iMate intraocular pressure sensor. Um, you've seen this animated video, uh, eye undergoing character extraction, this implantation of the intraocular lens at the time of cataract surgery, this device can be implanted into the sulcus. You see it's foldable. And in this device will allow real-time intraocular pressure monitoring 24-7. Uh, the company uh, has Implantata Ophthalmics has also de designed another version of this called the SC, uh, which is implanted, as you see, in the suprachoroidal space. So it can be implanted in eyes uh, other than at the time of cataract surgery. And then a patient just uses this handheld telemetry device to measure the intraocular pressure, which of course can be transmitted to a physician anywhere in the world. Now, this is an article from Klaus Christopher's group uh, looking at a group of 12 patients in which they implanted the keratoprosthesis together uh, with this intraocular pressure monitoring device. And the bar graph that you see here shows pretty good correlation between the measured intraocular pressure and the estimated pressure by finger tension. So in conclusion, novel keratoprosthesis designs and materials have been developed to address the limitations of the Boston type one keratoprosthesis. Uh, we expect the early feasible st uh, feasibility studies from Gore and the clinical trial from Cornet to begin late uh, next year or this year, hopefully. And telemetric intraocular pressure monitoring allows for continuous IOP measurement independent of the keratoprosthesis design. And unfortunately though, while a CE mark has been obtained for both the IO and SC intraocular pressure transducers, um, no clinical trial is planned in the United States at this time. Hopefully this will be available to you in India though in the future. I appreciate your attention. If you'd like to copy this presentation, you can just take a picture of the QR code as this is available on my public Dropbox site. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. I think that was absolutely spectacular and the future really looks bright for keratoprosthesis. And uh, I'm sure uh, uh, both the models that you talked about are uh, really going to be the, really going to be the future. So I think uh, with this, we move to the uh, next talk. And I think, uh, is that Dr. Rohit Shetty's screen? Yes, ma'am. I'm just trying to open my screen. I think, uh, was it Dr. Prajuna? I thought in the next talk. Anyway, now, since you've opened yours. So, uh, Dr. Rohit. On Shetty, my oh, on okay, okay. Okay, fine. Uh, Dr. Rohit Shetty, uh, again, uh, is uh, very well known to all of us. He's the clinical and translational scientist uh, at Narayan Netralaya, Bangalore. He's uh, the... Uh, uh, he's the uh, 
he's going to be talking about targeting biomarkers in the uh, dry eye and he's done a huge amount of uh, work at narayan netrale bangalore he's a vice cha- he's a vice chairman of uh, narayan netrale uh, bangalore and uh, also the faculty in the department of ophthalmology uh, maastricht uh, university so over to you dr rohit thank you ma'am can you hear me yeah okay my thank you uh, namrata ma'am ai was uh, for this wonderful opportunity my talk today is uh, targeting biomarkers in dry eye this is my financial interest to uh, do research with these companies this paper just came out a uh, few days back it talks about uh, speaks about the clinical pattern of management of dry eye it's a tfos based study and uh, we all are aware of these definitions but what they did was we looked at uh, different uh, pattern of how you diagnose and uh, treat dry eye and uh, what are the different uh, modalities of uh, treatment which has been used and this chart is quite exciting about you know it looks at uh, different uh, places across the world and what are the major uh, treatment options for it you can see that there's a wide variations of it you know sometimes you know some places you have uh, so uh, anti inflammatory immunomodulators in a smaller percentage fatty acids as the uh, essential fatty acid like omega 3 fatty acids have been used in many places this is hu- huge amount of and uh, they have also used uh, a stepwise algorithm not much different from what uh, we already know but uh, it's there in the paper but what is very interesting is the the last line of this paper the last paragraph of this paper it talks about this that means we are virtually treating uh, these diseases without understanding what is really causing this change the biggest challenge has always been what and how do we identify these biomarkers you know they are floating around all over all over the place but how do you identify them in the last uh, 12 to 13 years this has been my area of work and finally in the last 6 uh, months we have got this to reach the uh, the clinical outpatient of a clinician earlier it used to be in the all advanced research lab this is a point of care diagnostic kit this i call it the lab on chip you know it uses elisa fluorescence based uh, microfluidic device we have these molecules which has been included based on uh, the work done by us and and all the work uh, done by prominent uh, scientists and researchers on dry eye the culprits which are the real uh, cause of ocular surface problems so we thought why not build a lab on chip and this lab on chip uses uh, clear fluidics and we used uh, these all these wells are where you know you use the clear film uh, proteins and you know it coats with your specific antibody set and how you read it and this is what we do in the clinics which used to take uh, a pure research labs it takes by the shimmer strip taken by a fellow they extract uh, the buffer using uh, some well, the fluids there and you shake it and extract the clear proteins mm-hmm. and uh, use it on the cartridges here and the, this cartridge is put in a reading uh, uh, thing this is used in cancer biology also at the end of it <coughs> you get this report <coughs> now the best part is that you have a report which explains all the biomarkers which you have and this is the world's uh, first biomarkers in the tears to come out for the in the clinics and this takes an hour you look at we have in the past we have known about mmp9s but you have a lot of other molecules including tnf alpha 10 vegf <coughs> that means that it can be used for retinal evaluation also you can even use the aqueous or the tears so we did close to a few thousand eyes uh, before uh, we started the using in the clinic to look at what are these molecules which are higher what is interesting is we looked at controls subclinical inflammation and inflammation this is controls for healthy what is interesting is this group of people who are subclinical inflammation that means you don't really have signs of tbert or shermer's changes in them but these are the ones who actually trigger off a change and this is where you have to actually treat and this could also be a trigger 
if you're planning for a surgery or any of this kind. And we used all the same different molecules, whatever we have studied. And we found that the subclinical guys are the ones who are always on a different scale because they don't have the symptoms yet, but you'll start showing it up or they may have the symptoms, but they don't, they don't, may not have the signs. So the dry eye can present as multiple things. You can have a mix of signs and symptoms together. You may have only signs, only symptoms, but our treatment is all the same. You know, you choose uh, corticosteroids or you choose uh, one of your uh, uh, modalities, what has been given uh, by the paper, uh, which I just mentioned. But what we thought was using this uh, biomarkers, we thought the concept of biomarker enable specific targeted therapy. And this is just not for uh, ocular surface alone. You can try for, we have tried for glaucoma, retina, VEGF, and multiple things. And uh, this has been area of my interest now, uh, research of unknown, and this is where I, I start working on. For example, if this is a report of a patient X, and if you have an MMP9, this is what you could look at, immunomodulators. If you have an ICAMP1, which is this is the first time an ICAMP1 has been picked up. We talk about lifty grass and multiple things, but we don't know how many patients have an ICAMP1 increase. If you have a mix of MMP9 and ICAMP1, you can combine treatments. Or if you have a multiple things in, in a higher level, then you can look at corticosteroids or multi, or, or, or combination of these uh, therapies. So basically, you are trying to titrate your therapies based on what you're seeing. And this is exactly what I said. MMP9, we, we even quantify it. How much is the MMP9? For example, some patients have 3 lakhs. Then if you have a 3 lakhs MMP9s, which is so high, you cannot consider them to be treated just with your lubricant and uh, cyclosporine. You may need an IPL or a, thermo, or a lipid flow therapy. Let's discuss a few cases. This is a 26-year-old gentleman, comes for a refractive surgery. I'll, give, I'll be a little quick here. And you know, you have these uh, changes out here. And you do the test and you see the epithelial mapping is irregular. Now the question is, why is it irregular? And then you do the test and you know that the MMP9, instead of 49,000, is close to 1 lakh. So what do you do? When you have such high level of MMPs, if you do a surgery on it, this patient will end up not very happy. And what does ha what happens is he will have a poor nerve regeneration. His epithelial will become messy like this, high OSDI, glaring halos, and few poor quality of life. So what is the ideal approach? What we follow, you can look at uh, doing a B lipid flow or pre-treat them with, uh, with, with dry eye treatment and then you probably plan it. In this case, I did the lippy flow on him to reduce it and see this is what he had. And it just came back to 3000. And this is when you get a proper healing. This is when you don't end up patients coming back to you being unhappy. This is a second patient, uh, again, uh, with no evidence of uh, clinical dry eye, but a high level of OSDI, but his dry eye status is normal. But again, look at this. He has an ICAMP1 which is very high and also raise MMP9. See, in places where you have op options of giving liftigras, this would be a great case to consider uh, liftigras as his uh, treatment post-surgery because this is where you would probably be able to directly treat him because you are exactly targeting the therapy out there. And this is because that's the molecule which is affecting it. And this is very important to understand that you've been using drugs which are extreme. Be very careful about how do you use them because we can't just make patients spend a lot of uh, hundreds of dollars and say that it didn't work. That's because maybe the target may be completely different. Have we lost the have we lost the audio? Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. I think in between just for a couple of seconds, it was not there. I'm coming to the last part of my presentation. Uh, this is a patient, uh, you know, all of all the time you're worried about the PRK haze, one of the most, most biggest challenges haze. And whatever you do, you, you sometimes do get them. And we know that what are the suspects which can cause the haze, but is there any other factors? Uh, again, when you look at our uh, the kit here, you have this TNF-alpha. 
TNF alpha is one of the major drivers of case, and it can also be used for glaucoma surgeries outcomes because again, you have uh, when you have a fibrosis or the corneal conjunctival fibrosis or changes there, TNF alpha is a very important wound healing molecule here. So when you look at the TNF alpha, and when I do it before my surgery, I know that if this is higher, the chance of haze is higher. So you can pre-treat them or you can use mitomycin or things differently so that it reduces uh, before you do any procedure. So the take-home point is the future, you know, we are coming out with many drugs, even the previous speakers did mention a lot of new drugs, even for neurotropic keratitis or these, uh, these uh, uh, specific target uh, which, we're, which we're having. But the question is, if you don't know what you have, you're just treating in the dark. You're shooting in the dark. So accurate diagnosis is very important. Targeted therapy is the way to go. Cancer biology is completely about targeted therapy. You can monitor the progression and documentation of patient satisfaction because you know what you're treating. And uh, the customized approach is a way to do. And uh, biomarker pathfinder, BMP, what we call, is probably going to be one of the future direction of it. And uh, as we move on, we are close to around 5,000 samples being analyzed now. Uh, we have been using for vitreous, aqueous, uh, ROP. We even want to include dopamine in the future for myopic progression. So hopefully in a few years down the lane, once it gets to all the regulatory approval, it should be in your clinic uh, for you to use it. This is the team of scientists with whom I work. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Rohit. I think that was really a uh, very comprehensive uh, talk on dry eye and uh, the clinical uh, aspect of the dry eye was extremely well correlated with the uh, translational aspect. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. N. Venkatesh Prajna, who's done a, a huge amount of work on fungal keratitis. He's the chief of uh, cornea and refractive surgery services, director residency training program at Arvind Eye Care System. And uh, currently he's at Arvind Eye Hospital, uh, Madurai. He's going to be talking about fungal keratitis, uh, present and future. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Namrata. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'll be just sharing some of uh, the information uh, which we as an institution uh, are currently performing uh, in this field of fungal keratitis. So we all know, actually, larger ulcers can heal. We don't know how and why, but we just know that larger ulcers can heal with medication. We also have come across that smaller ulcers might not heal and might eventually perforate or require a therapeutic keratoplasty. Usually, we blame patient compliance alone but over the period of years, we've come to realize that a complex system of interactions, especially associated with the organism virulence and the human immune response may play a role. So our whole treatment and diagnostic strategy has been to see whether we can actually predict the treatment outcome in the field of fungal keratitis. In today's topic, I'll be concentrating two of my current works, the artificial intelligence work, where we are doing with the University of Michigan, where we plan uh, to develop a system which can prognosticate a corneal ulcer. And the second project, which I'm currently embarking on with uh, University of Edinburgh, is to look at uh, developing smart probes which would aim in diagnosing and aiding in precise treatment. The first, the AI part, mainly on the prognostication of corneal ulcers. This is actually an NIH-sponsored R01 project involving three institutions, uh, Aravind, Kellogg, uh, as well as Duke. Basically, what we want to see is whether in clinical practice, if I see a patient on day one, and if the patient comes for a follow-up on day three or day four, my assistant or my colleague sees it, he usually does not know what I have seen. And based on the signs and the presumed symptoms, they come 
to a conclusion whether the ulcer is healing or not. So our plan is to develop a quantitative artificial intelligence demonstrative project or a product which would actually give a value, something like a CSR, something like a macular edema value which an OCT gives uh, in for CSR or a diabetic macular edema. And then we know objectively that the patient is healing, the ulcer is healing. So this has been going on for almost three years. In 2018, we published uh, in Cornea where we just said that photography and computerized methods are better than ophthalmologists when we just measure the size of corneal ulcers. That was our first uh, demonstration where we said uh, a, a, a documented photography and a computerized method for measuring that photography would be much better than just the eye doctors uh, measuring the size of the ulcers. We followed it up two years later where we developed uh, in collaboration with Duke Institute. Uh, uh, we, we developed algorithms uh, again with Dr. Sina Farsiu who has done a lot of work in spectral SOCT. Uh, we developed good collaboration. We've now developed image analysis algorithms which actually meant that we had to use that artificial intelligence system to understand what an epithelial defect is, to understand what a stromal infiltration is, and to also make that instrument forget the light reflex, which can also reflect in a whitish manner. So that was uh, taking some time, but over a period of time, we've developed a fairly good algorithm, which at this point of time we presented, uh, we published it this year, where we say that it holds a lot of promise for quantification of corneal physiology and pathology, something like uh, the OCT measurement of macular edema. So with regard to artificial intelligence, we believe uh, that a well-developed artificial intelligence system can be a good source to possibly say whether this uh, ulcer is caused by uh, fungi or bacteria. And not only that, over a period of time, uh, if we actually employ this technique over second day, third day, fourth day, we are able to predict whether the ulcer is healing or not. And then from this knowledge, possibly we can develop an algorithm which can tell us at the time of presentation that this ulcer is more likely to progress and hence would require a much more aggressive treatment uh, than a, a regular ulcer. So that's the whole idea. We want to develop an instrument which will prognosticate uh, a corneal ulcer, especially fungal corneal ulcer. So that was the first project. The second project uh, was uh, trying to see uh, whether uh, the technology of smart probes, it involves a lot of chemistry, uh, whether that can diagnose and also aid in the precise treatment. This is in collaboration with the University of Edinburgh, Liverpool and University of Bath. And very interestingly, this, was not a, this is not a collaboration with ophthalmologists, but it's a collaboration with pulmonologists uh, because pulmonologists also uh, you know, have a lot of uh, experience working with fungus. Uh, so based on uh, their experience of diagnosing and treating uh, the fungal infections of the lung, we are now collaborating it and trying to replicate the same in the eye. So this is a team which combines uh, chemists, physicists, engineers, signal processors, and machine learners, as well as clinicians. And this was initially employed out by our collaborators uh, in the ICU at Edinburgh, where they could find out uh, by just injecting these smart probes, these chemical probes uh, into the lungs in vivo, and then trying to identify whether they're dealing with just an edema or they're dealing with an infecting organism or whether uh, they're just dealing with a case of alveolar collapse. So based on this experience, what we did was we used the similar uh, smart probes in the field of cornea. And uh, we looked at uh, the corneal scrapings and then compared it with just our regular gram stain and potassium hydroxide. Uh, we used uh, the chemical probe called the BAC2. We also used BAC1. 
But to give a long story short, what we say is the fluorescent smart probes, they offer a comparative methods to gram stain to know whether it is gram positive or gram negative bacteria. And now we've also identified some good fluorescent smart probes for fungus. Our idea is to use this technology in the field, in the vision centers. Uh, we are starting to develop some fluorescent microscopes, uh, a simple fluorescent microscope for less than 100 rupees, which can be employed in the field. If it sparkles blue, it's probably a gram positive. If it sparkles red, it's probably a gram negative. If it sparkles green, it's probably a fungus. So that's the whole idea. The story doesn't stop there. What our uh, co-investigators have also found out in the lung is not only do these smart probes detect the organism, it can also detect immune response. So there may be uh, smart probes which can actually target uh, and also tell us whether there is an increased activity of MMPs or human neutrophil elastases or cathepsins. And interestingly, using this technology, our investigators have actually applied a topical MMP inhibitor directly towards the lung, which actually suppresses MMP activity in the lung. So our idea is using these probes to actually diagnose the etiology, but also actually not only the etiology, but also diagnose any increased immune activity, but also finally, and more importantly, take the drug directly to the point where the drug is required, where it has to kill the fungus, it would do so, and where it would have to decrease the MMP activity with different uh, drug, it would, it would uh, do so. So that is the whole purpose of uh, this future related activity. So this slide was used by me 10 years ago, and I think it's slowly becoming a reality. And what I say is, at least in the future, if, a, if I get a fungal keratitis, I would be treated with natamycin P, where P will be for prajna, it would be uh, something, a small molecule tagged on along with natamycin, which would selectively cause a local topical uh, immunosuppression. And if somebody else gets a, a, a fungal ulcer, uh, they would be treated differently and not like how we are uh, treated now. And I, I, I foresee the generation 30 years or 40 years from now, uh, getting very surprised that all patients with fungal ulcers were being treated with one drug, uh, something like penicillin, which was being used as a wonder drug at one point of time. So in essence, at this point of time, our treatment of fungal keratitis is killing the fungus, and thinking that we have conquered the disease. But in the future, it is not going to be enough. It is going to be the interface and the whole treatment armamentorium is going to be concentrated on the interface, on the activity between the fungus and the host, which is going to actually determine who is going to heal and who is not. So we have shown in many publications that there is considerable variation existing between the fungi, even amongst the same species. You take 100 Fusarium solani, you have different pigmentation even amongst this 100 Fusarium solani. So not all fungi have same virulence, even if we are talking of the same species. And there is a differing host response to different fungi. And we have showed in our lab uh, for Aspergillus, and Fusarium, there is a differential expression of a zinc alpha glycoprotein in the tears, wherein for, fun, for Fusarium, it is a differing response, and for an Aspergillus, it's a differing response. Killing the agent does not necessarily mean controlling the disease, and the future is, I would have been ridiculed if I had spoken about using immunosuppression for fungal keratitis 10 years before, but COVID has given a lot of respectability to the use of immunosuppression, people are more scared of the cytokine storm rather than the COVID itself. So I personally think the topical selective, and that's the word selective immunosuppression, is going to be the way we are going to treat this disease in the future. Thank you very much. So thank you, Prajna. I think that was a real insight into what is going to happen 
in fungal keratitis uh, really very well put and I, i i wish you all the best i'm sure some newer things will again come out in fungal keratitis the next talk is going to be by uh, dr somshila murthy uh, she has sent a recorded uh, talk uh, and she would be joining in shortly uh, can uh, nikhil can you play it from your side or do i have to play it i think yes, i have to play it hello everyone i thank the all india ophthalmology society to give me this opportunity to present a talk on the update in the management of per peripheral ulcerative keratitis so what is peripheral ulcerative keratitis or puk it's an extremely rare inflammatory condition of the eye which can be associated with systemic autoimmune diseases collagen vascular disease association occurs nearly in 50% cases and the ocular manifestation can actually be an initial presentation of the disease so what are the clinical features of puk it can be unilateral or bilateral disease the classical picture that we would see would be a crescentric perilimbal corneal ulcer with sub epithelial infiltrate at the edge of the ulcer as can be noted in this clinical picture of a patient with peripheral ulcerative keratitis you can also note here that the adjacent conjunctiva and perhaps even the sclera shows inflammation the ulcer progressively spreads both centripetally as well as centrifugally there may be contiguous involvement of the conjunctiva episclera and scleral tissue and occasional anterior chamber reaction as can be seen in this clinical photograph so what are the causes of peripheral ulcerative keratitis we can divide the causes as either local which are isolated and occur in the eye alone or those causes which can happen in the setting of a systemic etiology in these cases obviously we would have to detect the systemic disease because some of these diseases have a high morbidity and mortality associated with them also some of these diseases can have a rapid progressive course leading to perforation in the eye which is an ocular emergency so to manage the disease is to locate the etiology coming to the local causes we can divide them as infectious causes which include bacterial fungal viral as well as parasitic and non infectious causes which include trauma post trauma the problems that are located in the lids and lashes neurogenic causes local autoimmune diseases such as murins coming to systemic causes we can have in diseases such as dermatological inflammatory bowel disease malignancy or even certain systemic infections can manifest with puk let us look at further at the local causes of either puk or puk like picture these can be subdivided as infectious and non infectious causes amongst infectious causes we can have various organisms which can lead to bacterial corneal ulcers and amongst them it can be staph streptococcus or gonococcus moraxella so these are some these are some of the bacterial organisms which can cause peripheral thinning and can resemble puk viral disease such as herpes simplex and herpes zoster are well known to occur as marginal keratitis and these can once again resemble puk both acanthamoeba and fungal keratitis can initially present as in an atypical form as a peripheral ulcerative coming to some of the in systemic causes the immune mediated causes of puk these include autoimmune disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis wegener's granulomatosis and many other such diseases even certain dermatological conditions and the list goes on to include inflammatory bowel disease and as well as systemic infections which i had talked about a little bit earlier in addition to cases which have local form of puk for example these two examples one of them is hsv necrotizing keratitis and the second is ocular surface squamous neoplasia so these would include either microbiological investigations in the first instance or in the second instance we might resort to doing a, a impression cytology of the surface and therefore we can rule out an infectious etiology or ocular surface problems and rare causes such as even ossn how about the differential diagnosis 
So he, once again, we can have various causes and we can classify them as inflammatory, degenerative, those associated with disease contiguous to the cornea as well as neoplastic as I showed in the previous slide and metabolic diseases. So the gamut of conditions that can lead to a peripheral ulcerative kind of picture can include Morin's as something as severe as Morin's ulcer or something as mild as a peripheral corneal uh, infiltrate as seen in contact lens patients. Sometimes you can have certain other diseases of the eye resembling peripheral ulcerative keratitis and I'll come to that a little bit later. So these are a couple of examples of patients who very different etiologies of PUK. The first is an example of a patient who had bacterial keratitis and with rapid uh, advancement of the disease, the patient developed a perforated bacterial corneal ulcer. When the patient came to us, we did scrapings from the edges of this ulcer and also took up the patient to apply tissue adhesive on this perforation, but uh, that didn't succeed actually because subsequently we did a corneal patch graph for this patient. On the other hand, we have a patient with a very advanced Morin's ulcer and you can see that almost uh, the entire cornea is affected. There's only a small amount of residual stromal island remaining and the peripheral area is extremely thin with staphylomath formation. The other causes of PUK-like picture, and we should not miss these, are cases of dry eye, especially ketoconjunctivitis sicca. So how do you differentiate between this condition? You can see the pictures of the right and left eye of a patient who we diagnosed as severe dry eye or ketoconjunctivitis sicca. So look at the lack of luster on the cornea, as you can note in the slit lamp images of both the eyes. And in addition, in the picture on your left also shows peripheral sort of a thinning and a delin effect as well as some infiltrate at the edge of it. So these patients are not the conventional peripheral ulcerative keratitis, but this, these are all changes secondary to lack of wetting in this particular instance. And the left eye, when we stain it, can pick up the areas which stain very well. The lower lid reflex uh, shows a very low lower lid tear meniscus for this particular patient. Other example of a patient with secondary Jogren's and presents to us with the right eye showing severe dry eye and in the left eye, there's, a, there's peripheral vascularization and a focal area of thinning, severe thinning with iris perforation, with iris plugging it, leading, which is a perforation. So sometimes these patients can be missed and can be instead diagnosed as peripheral ulcerative keratitis and the dry eye can be missed. So we must always be very careful in examining the ocular surface for all of the patients. These are other examples, more benign versions of what we can miss and what we can pick up as PUK or healed PUK. So these are not cases of inflammatory etiology, but this is a patient with Terrian's marginal degeneration. So what you can note, especially in the slit, is the peripheral thinned out area and the advancing portion shows whitish lipid deposition. And, and if we have, uh, if we look at this patient on slit lamp, we would also see a lot of vessels in the peripheral area. So this is a patient, it's usually a bilateral condition. This is the picture of, the, of another patient of Terrian's marginal degeneration, very advanced with a lot of lipid keratin. This is another classical example of Terrian's with lipid deposition at the advancing portion of the peripheral thinning. So sometimes these are often referred to us as uh, terrians. Uh, terrians are often referred to us as, as resolved active PUK. So this is in fact two pictures. One is this particular patient actually has old scleritis with peripheral ulcerative keratitis, which has now resolved and the patient is doing well with uh, treatment, with therapy, and but however, because of the vessels, the patient has lipid deposit. It's a very close looking differential diagnosis, but because we have history and treatment history for years of the scleritis, we know that this is not terrians. So how do you rule out infection? It's critical to differentiate between the two because the mainstay for therapy for non-infectious is steroids. And some of the infections, we cannot use steroids, for example, fungal keratitis. Also, if it's non-infectious, we know that the, the gravity is more because about 50% of these can be associated with systemic collagen vascular disorders. So therefore, this distinguishing between infectious versus non-infectious is extremely important. Remember that among the infectious, you can also have viral etiology, the HSV, varicella zoster virus, bacteria, as well as fungi and, and acanthamoeba. So we need to do an infectious workup for these patients. 
The second differentiation we need to make, especially in the case of Morin's ulcer, is to differentiate but for from other causes of PUK with scleritis. So here's a patient on the right side with scleritis and you can see that the entire eye looks extremely congested whereas in Morin's ulcer it's gradually progressing and does not involve the sclera. But both these conditions require referral to a higher center and co-management with a rheumatologist or a physician. So the management of PUK also depends on at what stage the patient presents to us. In the case of Morin's ulcer, we often resort to resecting the inflamed conjunctiva, applying either cyanoacrylic glue or amniotic membrane. Or if the patient comes with a perforation, we also resort to doing a teen and spatch graft. Intensive topical steroids and oral steroids and immunomodulators are advocated. And in very severe cases, we and even in one-eyed patients, we even switch to intravenous pulse steroids or cyclophosphamide or biologicals. So the management of POK really uh, depends on whether the patient has associated scleritis or systemic disease. And if the patient has, then really aggressive management is indicated and co-management with the rheumatologist. Uh, once again, I would like to thank AIOS for giving me this opportunity. So I think uh, Sumshala has uh, not been able to join. Uh, can we move to the next next talk, Tony? And then following that, we will take up the discussion. There are questions on the chat box otherwise also. So I think uh, we'll uh, go to the next talk by Dr. Rajesh Fogla. Uh, do we have his talk, Nick? Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. We, okay. we, we shall play it as you instruct us to. Yeah, please do play it. No, 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 not this one. No, no, this is not. No, 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 not this one. He has sent his uh, talk. Uh, he's. Uh... Uh, Ma'am, we have only the uh, launch video, not his talk. Okay. You have only this video. Okay. I think, uh, Tony, then we can uh, do the discussion and uh, let's try, try, let's let them figure out where the talk is and then we can have the talk subsequently. So there are a lot yeah. of yeah, questions there. Uh, yeah, we have a number of questions uh, in the chat. Um, let's see, maybe the first one we can have for Dr. Lee. Uh, this comes from Kunjal Sajpal. And Kunjal, tell me if I'm uh, reading this correctly. Uh, she writes, some eye banks in India perform RT-PCR on the donor, while some do not. Uh, what is your recommendation? So yeah, Lee, this, this is a question from all of us combined in India because that is our biggest, uh, you know, we really don't know what to do with it. So it's a question from 1.3 billion people there, Jennifer. Yeah. <laughs> they are looking at you. you Tony. No pressure. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is a question that we've gone back and forth on at the EBA as well. Um, but we really fell on the side of not recommending universal testing of our donors. Um, you know, the reality is that the testing hasn't been validated for cadaveric tissue. So that was one of the big reasons. Early on, we did not do testing just because there wasn't sufficient testing to, to do testing on everybody. And now I feel like, you know, we know that you will, that the, the RNA will probably be on the surface potentially a lot longer than, um, then the patient is probably infectious. And so you may end up with a lot of positives in patients who may be beyond the point of actually being infectious. Um, and you may lose donors that way as well. Um, so again, we, we've shied away from recommending uh, universal testing on all of our donors. Um, and I feel that uh, we've still been able to maintain the safety of our donor pool. And like I said, I, my suspicion, nagging suspicion is that um, the true risk of transmission is probably pretty low in general. Can I also add a point, Jen? That's a great point. Also, let's look at this from the other side of the story. Um, we, in, at least in the US, we've been doing transplants without RT-PCR on the donors and we haven't seen any sort of adverse events so far. Um, I can't remember um, seeing any of my patients of the past two years after transplant who actually had COVID. 
Um, that might be biased, that piece of information, because most of my patients were uh, vaccinated. There were a few that were not vaccinated. Um, but then all of them were tested for COVID. Uh, this is the time when we used to test all the patients before surgery. So, you know, I, I completely agree with you. We don't need to, at least for now, we don't know what's going to happen in future uh, recommend universal testing. Thank you. We have, uh, it looks like another question in the chat for Lisa, but is Lisa, is Dr. Nijum still with us? I think she has retired. I, I don't blame her. It's uh, in Chicago. I'm not sure whether it's, is it midnight or 1 p.m., Jennifer? Are they central or eastern? I think they're eastern. I think they're so, central. 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 Okay, well, it's after midnight, so she gets a pass. It, it, you're <laughs> only going to stay until midnight, and then you can stay lights out. Um, but one of the questions for her, and I actually – we put it to maybe you and uh, Vishal uh, and others. I don't think in India you have uh, approved topical human nerve growth factor, correct? No, it isn't available here. Okay. So the question for, for her was regarding its utility, its efficacy in patients with grade three neurotrophic keratopathy. Anybody like to share their, their experience uh, with it or... Anybody have a significant experience with using topical recombinant nerve human or growth factor for NK? I don't. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, 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 go ahead, please. Well, I know. I mean, I, I feel that my results on my patients have been mixed. Um, I've used it on a fair number of patients. Um, and I've, again, with sort of mixed results. Um, I don't know. Tony, do you use a lot of it? Yeah, I use a fair amount. I, I, as a full disclosure, I'm a paid consultant for Dom Pay. Uh, we were part of the clinical trial in the U.S. Um, you, you know, I always look at the data that's collected for approval and the data from Europe and the Reparo study and the data from the U.S. I think it's pretty compelling regarding the efficacy of it uh, in using it for stage two and three NK. It's approved for just NK. Um, so I have found it myself to be beneficial in cases of persistent epithelial defects with and without stromal necrosis when there have not been other confounding uh, factors. So in a patient with NK plus exposure, NK plus limbal stem cell deficiency, I have not found it to be as successful as the patient just with straight herpes zoster keratitis who can't heal. I found it to be quite useful in those cases. The big question is, of course, if it works to help close up the defect, what percentage of patients will still have intact epithelium six months, a year after treatment? In the two studies, it was somewhere around 75% of patients remained recurrence-free at around 50 weeks, I think, after treatment. Um, I found it to be a little bit less than that. I have a little bit higher percentage of patients who have recurrence of the epithelial defect following treatment. Uh, and in a few of them, I've uh, treated them for a second course with, with good results. I have not used it a lot for stage one NK, which is the big question is, is it effective for stage one NK? And obviously there are other medications under development, like the one from Oyster Point Pharmaceuticals, looking at uh, different agents for treating stage one NK. So maybe in a few years, we'll actually have agents that are FDA approved for specific stages, and we'll use them uh, for different patients uh, with different stages of NK. Uh, so I have a, Dr. please. So, Doctor Aldavi, would you use it uh, uh, before trying autologous serum because that's more cumbersome to procure? Well, good question. It, autologous serum is more cumbersome to procure, uh, but it's fairly inexpensive. I mean, the serum, of course, is free, but preparing it, there are some costs. As you may know, that there is a significant cost barrier with the uh, medications and regimen in the United States. It's around $10,000 US dollars per week for an eight-week course of treatment. That having been said, I yet uh, have encountered a situation where I wanted it for a patient and could not get it. So insurance companies and uh, Medicare are paying for the medication. Um, so to answer your question, Kunjal, um, I am usually going to autologous serum maybe first, let's say, for a stage two patient. 
If that's not working, then and other therapies don't, then going to Snedrimin. Uh, truth be told, a lot of patients sent to me have already had autologous serum, already had a bandage contact lens, already had MAC membrane transplantation. It's failed. That's why they're sent to the university. So I end up using Snedrimin uh, earlier on in those patients in my treatment. I think Nikhil has a similar uh, similar question on for NK. Nikhil, I think you typed it. Uh, yeah. No, I was just thinking like there are some two or three articles on insulin uh, eye drops because they stimulate maybe uh, the IGF-1 and growth factor. So any of the panelists could have any experience or whether it's worth trying in some of those cases, which because we don't have nerve growth factor here. so. Can we try them? Insulin eye drops have been tried for dry eye, if I'm not mistaken. I remember re reading a paper on that. Yeah, I, I don't have any experience using insulin or insulin-like growth factors for management of NK. I don't know if anybody else does, but I don't. Right. I have treated a couple of patients with insulin eye drops uh, back in Melbourne. Um, mixed response. Uh, as Dr. Namrata said, there have been quite a few publications now. Um, I know folks in Europe, uh, uh, they, they use insulin more than we do. But again, it, it's, it's worth a shot. You know, these are patients, as uh, you know, we saw in the presentation that sometimes you see them at such a late stage that you want to try everything that you can. Serum eye drops, uh, PRP eye drops. And uh, the team from India is, is known for uh, the umbilical cord blood okay. serum eye drops. We, we should hear from them uh, the, the magic cure for, for everything on the epithelium. So at one point in time, cord serum was the panacea for you know everything, whether it was persistent epithelial defects. And we published all the results, whether it was acute chemical injury uh, in various grades of severity. But the only thing, again, is that it is difficult to procure. I mean, only institutes can do it. And I don't see any, uh, you know, any company wanting to commercialize it. It probably is not, you know, uh, commercially viable, but uh, it does help. It does help. Rohit, you were talking about something about MMP9 and the use of uh, nerve growth factor. Uh, not on the nerve growth factor, but uh, what I feel is a uh, lot of these uh, ocular surface has along with the nerve issues are driven with a lot of other inflammation. So these uh, molecules, like even the insulin, apart from its other factors of nerve growth, also has a lot of anti-inflammatory properties on your... Uh, so I think that's, that's the way it's probably working to improvise the surface. Okay. Anybody has... Tony, any other... I think Paras has put up a question. Uh, can I ask one question yeah. uh, to Dr. Prajna? Yeah, yeah, Himanshu, please do. Yes, Himanshu, please do, go ahead. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. But your photograph is frozen, but then that's fine, it's okay. It's okay. You were not... Um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so I, I, my internet connection is unstable. That's I've written the question in the chat. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Prajan, I wanted to ask you that uh, when we do anything AI-based, we give different classifiers, and then AI gives the weightage, and then finally you get... And it's very difficult to know what AI has looked into. That's why that's a, it's sort of a black box kind of thing. So if we just uh, give uh, only the photographs and without giving all the other paraphernalia as other predisposing factors uh, or uh, like the organism, size of the ulcer, the corneal sensations, uh, the sensitivity, the compliance. Uh, do you think the AI can go wrong there and AI can just take something and you know, dish out a thing which may not be very relevant? Uh, let me answer it in uh, two phases. The, the way uh, I have put my presentation was on three slides. Uh, that was on the work for like close to about four to five, uh, five years. And uh, there were a lot of information being fed into that uh, computer. 
for getting that thing. It was just not digital photographs alone. It was also right from the history, from the microbiology, trying to make it see as many variations as possible. That's my point number one. But once we get it, once we get that thinking process right, and once the finished product comes out, it should be able to predict at least whether it's healing or not. Uh, the, the, but then, but I see a lot of tremendous potential. I, I, I personally think that uh, there should be a risk. There will be a risk stratification score. And uh, the way I look at it is like, if it is 445 today, I'm just giving you an arbitrary number. And we are saying it is 476 uh, after four days. Even, and even if the patient says that my pain is lesser, that pain would have just been lesser due to the ciliary spasm and not due to the ulcer uh, getting healed. So I think uh, once we put a risk stratification system in place fairly, uh, I think we should be able to get some very good information over a period of time. Yeah. Totally agree. Thank you. But the AI will also have to learn the resolution of, you know, the keratitis over a period of time. I think that timeline also the AI will have to learn as to how uh, it resolves because uh, the host is there and like very nicely you put in the last slide that the response also, you know, needs to be something that needs to be quantified or uh, it's different when you look from your own eyes and different with the AI. Exactly. Uh, but but Namrata, the, the whole idea is the concept uh, yeah. if, we, if we get the concept first and then over a period of time we give it to the next generation of ophthalmologists to evolve that into a different product but i think i think as a, as a concept this looks very interesting and this looks like a neglected uh, aspect at this point of time and what really excites me at least when i did my pg uh, the csr thing I, I i go back to that thing we never we never used to quantify it we, we just used to have an yes or no answer and we just used to go by uh, the patients uh, saying whether it's improved or not. But now we really have a quantitative measure to it. And likewise, if we have that concept right, and then we, we develop a quantitative measure of the healing process, and then also uh, get, get a risk stratification just by the appearance. You know, this tentacle is not right. This thing happening in the periphery, you, you give a weightage of 25, if it's the center, you give a lot less weightage and all that things have to be put in place. I think there is a concern which Paris has put in. Paris, uh, can you raise that concern? And this is actually truly the concern for all of us uh, who are seeing these cases and we really don't know uh, whether it is because of the protocol or because of the procedure. And we would like to discuss that. Paris, can you? Yes. yes. Uh, in fact, we have been seeing some, you know, I mean, sporadic cases, not a very huge number, but yes, post CXL, there is a history of CXL three years back or a few years back. And suddenly these patients do come with uh, stromal thinning and eventually end up into a corneal perforation. So is it is it uh, like related to some uh, like protocol or could it be, you know, these are the cases who have uh, some inflammatory background and but that it is not an acute phase. It, it happens after some time, you know, three years down the line or sometimes four years down the line. I ended up seeing four cases so far. Um, one of them was my, my case with, uh, you know, well-diagnosed keratoconus, uh, underwent uh, CXL uh, two years back. And he was doing extremely well. He was doing very well on RGP lenses, like the rose K lenses, 6X, both eyes. And... I just don't know. I mean, it, it is a very scary phenomenon. So, Dr. Shetty, would you like to comment upon this? Yes. Uh, you know, like I mentioned in my presentation, even though they don't have, a lot of them don't have uh, proper uh, symptoms, but if you look at their tear markers, especially in keratoconus, they're like 100 times higher than what a normal person would have. So, you don't know that they're going through that because they don't have the classic signs of your uh, redness and swelling and all that. There's something which is actually preventing them to showcase that. So, for example, if say MMP9 is say 49,000, is less than that is what our values are, you would see in keratoconus sometimes even 32 lakhs. 
a person with 32 lakhs you do a cross linking it, it it does go down in your in your initial phase because you use steroids and all that stuff but the the cycle of inflammation is going to come back again it's going to come back again to 38 lakhs 39 lakhs and you have again change the keratocytes because keratocytes are dead because of your cross linking at least for 9 to 11 months sometimes it delays the nerves don't grow the way it should be a lot of keratoconus patients don't have they they also suffer from your neurotropic uh, issues if you look at their nerves their nerves are at least 30 to 40% lesser in many of them and these patients post cross linking will again reduce their nerves uh, because of your uh, surgical procedure itself so inflammation loss of nerves keratocytes change all that is, is a very good medium for a stromal thinning so many times many sorry just to complete many yeah. times in my practice we do i mean uh, we i do check for all of them and see if it's very high then we try to treat them before you actually take them for a cross linking and that's one of the reasons i've been talking about ige vitamin d and all these factors which are treatable factors because when these are higher your 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 ocular surface is also built with uh, all kinds of inflammatory cells does it mean that we have to change the guidelines before you know selecting these patients for cxl and the other thing is as clinicians uh, in a solo practice how do we you know i mean come to know about this this group of patients that that's, is you know something scary yeah that's see uh, these kind of biomarkers things will take at least few years for it to be a practice eventually it will be but uh, that's the reason you know we get i was mentioned for many years we have been talking about surrogate markers surrogate markers are ige vitamin d and all your deficiencies though, which change the ocular surface immune profiling and these markers gives you an indirect link peak preview into what is actually happening if you treat them you actually treat them uh, for your ocular surface also so this has been routine protocol in nn for uh, any yeah it's done and we have we have published uh, both a lot of work on both ige and vitamin d in many I think uh, to come into practice, the economics is also going to play an important role because you need to spend to get these tests done. And uh, I think that is going to play an important role whether it really translates uh, and how far it translates into clinical practice. So uh, there is a question, uh, Himanshu. Himanshu can, I, yeah, Himanshu, can I just add something to that discussion? Okay, please, please. Okay. I think the other thing we should think about is role of genetic predisposition. Uh, we reported a, uh, actually a physician uh, in Cornea Journal two years ago who had cross-linking and then developed bilateral corneal perforation. And we did genetic testing on her and found a number of mutations in the ZNF469 uh, gene, which is associated with brittle cornea syndrome. The pathogenicity of these variants was somewhat unknown though because, or unclear, because they're very rare in the general population, but they're enhanced in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, which she was Ashkenazi Jewish. So question is, were these really pathogenic? Um, she was a bit atypical as far as a keratoconic and that she had diffuse corneal thinning, wasn't just located at the apex of the cone, but it wasn't quite keratoglobus. Uh, her progressive ectasia developed later in life, et cetera. So we concluded that in patients who present with a bit of an atypical phenotype, um, that you should maybe consider doing genetic testing. And if that individual has suspicious variants in the ZNF469 or, or the PRDM5 genes associated with brittle cornea, probably best to avoid cross-linking. Okay, Himanshu? Uh, yeah, my question was uh, to Dr. Jennifer Lee. Uh, so should you use the tissue from a COVID positive donor? And if not, then why don't we test every uh, donor? I still think you're confusing a infectious patient from a patient who you can get a positive uh, reverse transcriptase PCR on, right? I mean, even now in the US, at least for us at my workplace, if you test positive with PCR testing for COVID, uh, you can't go back to work for five days, right? We quarantine for five days. At five days, they'd stop testing PCR because it's probably going to come back positive and they start doing antigen testing, right? And so the antigen testing, if it's negative, allows you to go back to work. And then at 10 days, you're just going to go back to work regardless of whether or not 
you know, any testing is performed. And, you know, I think there is an element of, um, again, we're, we're all doing our best to try and figure out what's going to be safest. I mean, when we started off this whole pandemic, we were deferring tissue for 28 days. I mean, and that seems awfully long at this point. We're cutting it down now. It's 14 days. And uh, there are, are thoughts about cutting it even further to 10 days uh, deferral for positive COVID positive patients, COVID positive donors. Um, again, I think the testing is, again, not um, validated for cadaveric donors for starters. And I think you are going to end up with probably more false positives um, and donors that you are not going to be able to utilize from a pot for, uh, that perhaps isn't truly infectious. Yeah. Can I make comment? a comment here? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. I think, you know, it is the uh, understanding of, you know, last two years regarding the, you know, uh, I, I, I banking, corneal transplant, or any organ transplant, we have understood various things. One is uh, the various regulatory uh, things which have come out from the organizations, especially for the government, regarding the uh, uh, aspects to be taken into consideration, not only for the patient, the people actually working in the eye bank and transplant centers, and our people are going to retrieve the tissue. The safety of a personal is also a very important aspect, what uh, Jennifer is talking about. That is one area we cannot uh, disregard that. Second is uh, actually isolating those patients who are actually infected or who have a symptoms, who died because of symptoms. That is, a, I think, at this present time, we know that we can't touch those people. It is only those people who have been either asymptomatic uh, or they died because without any history or uh, uh, no, any symptoms of, of COVID. We know that we realize that around 30 to 40% of patients don't have symptoms of COVID at all. They may be positive. And uh, there has been no report till date that it can be transmitted to any transplantation. In that regard, we are quite safe now. In fact, now the regulations have come up that we should not be testing uh, for COVID for any donors now if they are asymptomatic or they know history of a COVID in these cases. I think in future we'll also realize if you have a donor, the tissue can be used if, the, if we are not doing any testing. So I think it will take some more time to understand if we should use COVID positive donors or not. But I'm pretty sure because uh, the science will tell us that nothing is going to happen now. Because the, you, you may have a RNA in these tissues, but they may not actually come up with a COVID infections. So we are quite safe in that regard. Only thing we have to respect the regulation that, you know, our people have to be safe when they are going for retrieval, especially for, uh, you know, uh, voluntary donations. Because their things are a little different than a, a hospital-based uh, donation where we do have most of the time reports of COVID. And uh, in our place also, I was... Uh, very strict in that way, the RT-PCR test should be done for all the donors. Now, recently, our institution also has stopped uh, regulation of RT-PCR for any donors. So uh, even for uh, admissions also. Now we are not doing RT-PCR testing for a patient who are getting admitted for a routine things, as well as for surgeries also. So that is a relaxation which will come because of understanding of our entire process. Uh, Himansu, I will be sure that within the next six months or one year, things will be much brighter. And I think we'll have a positive, you know, increase in the number of our donation and transplant services. So, uh, Nikhil, uh, can you put up your question for Dr. Titi also? Yeah, no, I just wanted to ask, sir, that uh, in the period where you were doing RT-PCR, how many were really rejected? Like what percentage of tissues were rejected? So we have some idea as to, you know. Yeah, Nikhil, you're right. Uh, there has been a you know a publication from Dr. Ritu Aroda from uh, uh, GNAC I Bank. In our place also, we didn't publish, but I uh, put that in a, one of the IGO, uh, uh, I think, commentary that uh, in period between uh, 2021, we did have around 360 dona donations happening. Of that, we had, uh, I think, around 12 uh, came positive. RT-PCR positive, though it has to be discarded. The number was less, but we did have, that means we did have an asymptomatic patient because we screened all those donors. Right. Despite that, we had a positive results. 
And uh, no, we didn't use those tissues. Yeah. But and I know that Dr. Ritu did uh, use one tissue, which uh, they came to know later that it was a positive, but nothing uh, happened to uh, both donor or the staffs. Sir, uh, those eyes which were rejected, uh, I think there were 12 donors and 24 eyes, and uh, even pathology and microbiology people studied from our main AIMS department, and they did not find any uh, anything in those tissues. Although they were RT-PCR positive on the swabs, but the tissues did not reveal anything. So, uh, and Dr. Ritu did find that they were positive, but then the, the flip side of that study was that they were actually uh, using the tear samples from both the eyes because uh, uh, in order to study the tear samples. And they, they did it in moderate cases and severe cases because from the mild cases, they, they could not find anything. I think Dr. Aldave had uh, used uh, such kind of uh, tissue and I'm, I, I think last time he had a talk on this thing which was very interesting. Uh, Dr. Aldave, would you want to come in here? Did you, uh, Dr. Tony? I actually have to confess, I have an email open right now uh, to uh, somebody at the EBA. I think, Jennifer, you're collecting these cases. Yeah, I, I remember it, Jennifer presenting yeah. something that in that Jennifer, Jennifer DiMatteo just emailed me. She... Uh, <laughs> And I'm just responding to her during this conversation. So, so yes, um, in October, I was notified uh, the day after I did a DMAC that the donor uh, tested positive for uh, COVID, uh, for SARS-CoV-2, via post-mortem nasopharyngeal swab performed by the medical director. The mate cornea went to my colleague here at UCLA, who also performed a DMAC. Um, the patient uh, history, of course, was negative, no symptoms. The only thing that indicated possible infection was this postmortem nasal pharyngeal swab. So I talked to my patient, advised him the situation, and told him he could swab quarantine if he wanted. We could actually have him tested for, for COVID uh, several days later. I did order the test. He did not have it done. He never actually developed symptoms of COVID, and neither did the recipient of the mate. Uh, we reported in Cornea Journal last year, I believe there was eight cases of transplantation of corneas, same situation where one agency does the testing, they don't inform the eye bank, the eye bank releases the tissue. These were all post-mortem nasal pharyngeal PCRs that were positive, and none of the recipients developed COVID except for one. In that case, it was thought to be community acquired because the person who had the transplant received it had multiple family members infected with COVID prior to his becoming infected. And I think Jennifer, uh, Jennifer DiMatteo told me now there's something like 20 cases and you had it in your, one of your slides. I think it were close to about 18. I think there's 10 18, more okay. since our publication. Yeah, but, um, anecdotal, but obviously as that number increases, I think it gives us a little more comfort that even if a case slips through our screening criteria, unlikely for the recipient developed COVID. Well, and you know, there's gotta be a ton that have slipped through. I mean, we look at the, data out of Eversight in Michigan, um, and they screened all of their donors, people who had are, would have been candidates for donation or, or eligible for donation. Um, it was close to 5% of those patients, of those donors tested positive. Um, right. And the vast majority of US banks were not doing routine, are not doing routine testing. And so if you think 5% of all of the banks that weren't testing may have had a positive swab. I mean, we haven't seen an outbreak yet, so. Right, I think the study from Southwestern also very similar number uh, of, of about four to five percent of corneas that passed all the screening criteria in which the postmortem test was positive, so. I think we can take one last question. I think that's to Vishal Imanshu. Vishal, I, I wanted to know that uh, when would you start cyclosporin or tacrolimus, uh, you said, and how long you're going to continue uh, in your cases of GVHD? So, thanks, Manchu. I start cyclosporin eye drops in all symptomatic patients, all of them. And I cover with the fluoromethylone 0.1% eye drops. I, I prefer using that over uh, Lodipred or prednisolone because of the IOP issues. Um, they stay on cyclosporin, you know. I would say at least a year. 
Uh, again, it also depends on how the systemic GVHD is looking like. And that's why I mentioned repeatedly in my talk that I stay in touch with my hemon team. Um, if the patient is stable, you know, I might take them off uh, cyclosporin and fluoromethylon both. Um, in flare-ups, uh, I increase the fluoromethylon. I, again, I try not to use prednisolone eye drops uh, if I can get away without doing that. Okay, so I think uh, we have we come to the close of the session, and uh, I would like to thank everybody, uh, particularly Konya Society International, uh, for doing this session for us. Uh, I know it's very late in the night, Tony. What time is it? Is it past uh, midnight? It's time to have it. It's happy hour. It's ten thirty at night, but it's not that late. Okay. So thank you so much. And I would like to also thank um, the uh, uh, Konya Society of India, uh, Dr. Himanshu Matalia, President, and Professor Jeevan S. Titial, Chief of RP Center of Ophthalmic Sciences, as well as the President of Indian Society for Cornea and Keratorefractive Surgeons. All the panelists and all the speakers, I think, did a great job. We had some of the very illuminating talks. So thank you once again, and hope to see you in person, everybody, very soon. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Have a good day ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Namrata. Thank you. All over behalf. Thank uh, you. Wonderful session. Uh, wonderful session. Thank you. Tony is doing wonderful sessions. No, no. Well done. Thank you you guys take care. No, no, no. You, you, you crafted the theme. You crafted everything. It was too good, Tony. <laughs> beautiful. So for it is a pleasure to you, Dr. Adabe. Yeah. Great to see you, Kunjal. You look younger yeah, than you. Very nice I'm... to see you. So very nice to see you, Dr. Nari. No, I, I, I especially, uh, you know, called Kunjal only because I know that Kunjal is Tony's fellow. And Thank you so much. Here. So I'm <laughs> reaping the benefits even after a decade of leaving UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Oh, you, you're gone, but not forgotten. <laughs> I'm so Thank glad you. to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. you guys. Yeah. Take care. Hopefully, we'll see you in Washington, D.C. for Ask Chris. Namrata. Sure, surely, surely. Too. All right. Thank Take you. care. Bye, everybody. Now. Thank you. Thanks, Atta. Thank you. Thank you. Are you coming? Can I come at 4 o'clock? Okay, sir. Live, Nikal, Diana. Right?